And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show. Presented by RIA Advisors. Hey, it's as real as it gets on Financial Fitness Friday. I'm Rich Rosso, CFP, Danny Ratliff, CFP. Hope you all have all your fingers still attached after the 4th of July. How was your 4th of July, Danny? Any Roman candles going off in your head? No. What's no. going on? It's pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, pretty low key. That's the way to do it. Not a lot of fireworks in my area. I think it's because of the day it fell on, you know? It yeah. It the weekend. Yeah. Brace for tonight, though. Everybody's just saving them. Oh, is that what it is? Celebration continues. Heck. 1776 all over again. That's okay. We'll deal with that. We also have to deal with the markets. Yesterday, we had a rough day. That ADP report sort of shook me up a little bit. Couldn't understand that number. So today's job number, we are going to see. Obviously, the job market's been surprisingly strong in 2023. Something Danny and I have talked about, about the rich, rich session keeps rolling. That this is... It may not be a recession, but you have a lot of higher income earners that have been absolutely hurt. We've had more white collar layoffs. We haven't seen the wage growth for the richer Americans. So it probably feels like a recession has already begun. So everybody is going to be anxiously awaiting uh, this number today, Danny. Estimates 240 plus thousand jobs. It's obviously been mired in the leisure and hospitality area more than anything else as of course we are in the fear of missing out in the service side of things uh and people are still getting out there and doing their thing so it's it's definitely strange <laughs> well it's very strange you look at the market breadth which we've talked about over uh -huh. and over the areas that are still doing well versus the areas that you know the majority of the market just hasn't participated so yep that has made this extremely difficult, not to mention now yesterday, we get stronger than expected data, you know, 497,000 jobs, that's a lot. And the market goes down and yields are popping, right? But now mm -hmm. the concerns are that yields are going to have to potentially go a bit higher, at least in the interim or short term. And that's going to impact or tighten even more so everything else, right? So. Mm -hmm. That is where you start to run into issues. And so how can they can they thread this needle is the, the trillion dollar question. Market's been hoping that there'd be rate cuts. But frankly, you and I have been talking about the fact that the Fed, the way inflation has been, yes, it's come down off its highs. But has it been stubborn at this level, especially where wages are? Absolutely. You're also seeing labor hoarding. Listen, you're not going to get rid of employees because you may never replace them again. So this is going to be a different kind of a grind down than we're used to. And the market's been remarkably resilient. Obviously, there have been a lot of narratives thrown at the market that's worked, like AI. That's been a big one. Also, I think there's been this hope that the Fed was going to be lowering rates. <clears throat> and I don't see that. Matter of fact, I still think that the Fed's got one or two rate hikes ahead. And even when they do that, I think they will keep those rates. Uh, so they'll sustain them at a higher level for longer, I think, than this market anticipates, Danny, because of the fact that we're not going to see the unemployment tick up based on where we've been and where we are now with labor force participation. So and, and what and is that? I mean, is yeah. it could be a couple things, right? Is mm -hmm. it a demographic change? Is it an economy change? Is it the pandemic change? I mean, well, there's I so many variables. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, listen, core PCE is 4.6%. was at 47 It's not budging. And I understand some of the rate hikes, hikes haven't made it through the system, but let, let's, let's face it. It's about time the market deals with the honesty of it that the Fed is probably not done. Well, but the Fed has also broken something already, broken the financial markets. How mm -hmm. much more... Are we going to have to see for the market to actually follow suit? And, and or is it different because we saw as they were hiking, the market declined as much as it did. And now it's kind of looking forward in the in the. You know, it's not looking in the rearview mirror 
as mm-hmm. it has historically has, it's looking out the windshield. Yeah. And again, um, I it'll be interesting to see with this number. Obviously, ADP and the jobs number today, they usually they're not always obviously in sync. So we're going to wait and see what that number is like. So the market's been it's actually pretty flat right now. We've seen yields spike here. Yeah, two uh, years two as year high as so what, mm-hmm. 2006, 2007? Yeah. So actually, the market, is, I think, handles it pretty well. I think, again, a pullback here would not be, I, I think would be healthy. We've got way extended in a short period of time. So now we're going to wait and see where, where this pullback goes to to decide to add exposure. But it's obviously that this market's pretty resilient. And um, as long as people are out there spending, and they are spending, um, that it's, it, the Fed is going to keep rates where they are. And to your point, I think you made a good um, point. I think it's a storm of a few things. I do think there's a demographic change as millennials are going into whatever their peak earnings years are, and they want houses. Look at where housing is, right? We haven't seen a lot of inventory of secondary homes, but look at new homes, right? You've seen home building stocks take off. Eventually, I think that has to cool off. But you got that cycle. You still have people that have been hit in the head during being locked up for two years. And gosh knows how that rewired the brain for spending. I mean, I think there's just a lot that's going into what we see right now. And most important is to see how the market reacts. Frankly, personally, I am absolutely surprised by how well the market's handled it. And I understand the breath stinks. Uh, no pun intended. Um, and uh, although there has been, we have seen a sort of a broadening out of that, of that AI story, more away from it a little bit, but it's still tech and AI are ruling the roost. But I, I, am, sh- I am surprised at the resiliency of the market in the face of the Fed and this endless hope. And I understand markets are mostly positive. And I think, so are investors. They're always looking for the sunshine, even through the cloud. But there's going to be a point here where the Fed is not going to be happy about how things are continuing on the jobs front, and they're going to have to take more action. And I just don't think the market's prepared for that yet. Well, we also have to just be prepared with the Fed. The Fed is going to be very quick to turn, as they historically have been. Mm-hmm. And just like leading up to this, I mean, I don't think they appreciated the magnitude of and I don't I'm not sure anybody did because nobody knew in the extent of how long this would go from a stimulus perspective both mm-hmm. monetary and fiscal policy this is something that it you know it was it had great magnitude so now trying to unwind this or let this flow through the system is much different but it, it's like that until it's not essentially I mean the Fed who was hey this is transitory got way behind the curve mm-hmm. had to hike extremely fast on the back end of this, it could be the exact same thing. And what we're likely to see is just like we're seeing rates kind of move all on their own without the Fed actually having to physically do anything. We'll see that on the opposite end. We just will. what's the time? What's the time frame? I think that is the big question. I think that's the I think that's the big question. And I personally don't see rates coming down until maybe 2025, 2026, if this keeps up. We'll see. We'll see. We have to remain nimble. And we're going to talk about a few things when we get back. How about when you move from accumulation to distribution stage, right? You've been working and now you're going into retirement. That's a big shift. Huge. (laughs) Feels good when we get back. Can use delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Declare your financial independence and prepare for the second half of 2023 with the RIA Mid Year Economic Review, Saturday, July 22nd, with Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Chief Investment Strategist Lance Roberts. Get our report card for the market so far and what you need to know to invest profitably for the rest of the year. Register now for the RIA Mid Year Economic Review, Saturday. 
Friday, July 22nd with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So here's one that's a bit strange. So there's this uh, sort of this talk on the internet that if uh, they made a movie about Elon Musk, who would play Elon? Which actor do you see in the Elon role? And you're never going to guess who's winning this, but maybe you all want to. Take a shot at it. Leonardo DiCaprio. That's a good guess. Christopher Walken. <laughs> I think he's a little too old, but I think he could have done a good job. A little CG. No. Well, yeah, Fix they've done that up. like in the Indiana Jones movie. Mm-hmm. They're using that technology to make you look younger. So the weirdest part about that tech is... Uh, Because I saw the movie was the um, he does look younger. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you can't tell, but the movement of the individual is a lot slower. (laughs) I want that subscription. You want the CGI? Yeah. How can I get some of that for me? I don't know. We should open CGI. Oh, just shops. live in an alternate universe. I mean, yeah. well, we're already well, there. The metaverse still here. We're in the Babylon B verse. Exactly. So the uh, winner of the Elon Musk contest is Kathy Bates. <laughs> oh, jeez. You would have never guessed it, and neither would I. I thought Christopher Walken was a stretch, but man. <laughs> I don't know if she slicks her hair back. Maybe a little Kathy more. Bates? And I hope she does misery, and she's got Zuck in the bed. <laughs> That's what I hope. So is this I would a- like to see a misery redone with Kathy Bates... With Elon Musk as Kathy Bates. Right. And Zuck as the James Conn dude. That's what I would like to see. But using real hammers and stuff. So is this an actual survey or just something no, you No, it's some actual with? psychotic okay. survey. All right. <laughs> you found Obviously, this somebody got that vial at the White House and started using mm-hmm. it. And, um, so the, um, <laughs> this are... <laughs> The sorry, a mid-year economic yeah. review. Transition from that. I, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a jump. It's a jump. This mid-year economic review is going to be very good. Um, we want to go through a recap of the year so far and give you an idea of what we think you should be doing going forward. So this is with Lance Roberts, July 22nd. Uh, be really important uh, to tune in to this uh, candid coffee on the Saturday morning before you start your day. And um, I think it'll be very informative because there are a lot of people scratching their heads. 
about this. Here's another head scratcher. We have always been told, Danny, uh, that, hey, when baby boomers age and they start to retire, they're going to liquidate their stock portfolios. So wait for the big sell-off because it's a coming. And guess what? This is a study that was taken out of Vanguard. Nearly half of Vanguard 401k investors actively managed their money, money over age 55 had more than 70% of their portfolio in stocks. In 2011, 38% did. And this at Fidelity Investments, this is an article out of the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to key off this a little bit. Nearly four in 10 investors aged 65 to 69 hold about two-thirds or more of their portfolio in stocks. So you think about having significant exposure to stocks later in life can be risky. And, and we talk about this in our right lane classes a lot of times as, as markets said they are. And I think the, the Schiller PE is now roughly 31 times. If you're going to be retiring within five to 10 years and you have most of your money in equities, well, you can very well get derailed from your strategy. You may not be able to go into distribution phase, as you think. But I sort of understand, Danny, and there are studies, and we, we sort of follow this in our financial planning process, but I get where older baby boomers just feel comfortable with individual stocks. And this is at a time where most firms are just going to do ETFs. I don't think there's a broker who can analyze a stock for the life of them out there uh, or they're outsourcing it. And I'm sure not all of them, but let's put it that way. You're a dinosaur. We like individual stocks in, in many cases, but I can see why, you know, they look to do their own homework and they feel comfortable once they make that decision. And, you know, from what I see, they're looking at larger cap dividend producing stocks to help supplement income. But boy, this is a turn based on what we've always been told about once the older baby boomers retire, that there would be this great stock liquidation. I think it's, I think it's a couple of things, Rich. I mean, I think, number one, a lot of people are a lot more comfortable with an ETF because they don't have to get it all right. They just have to get the sector right or the area uh, versus, you know, mm -hmm. having to be so defined into something that's very concentrated. But to your point, people are, and I think they've always, especially once you get towards retirement, you gravitate more towards the dividend paying companies mm -hmm. and maybe something that you can understand the fundamentals, understand what's behind it. And unfortunately, as of right now, they haven't done nearly as well as, you know, those handful of companies that have, but I think some of it may be, um, I'm not going to say a lack of education, but a, a lack of knowledge on how some things work. If you look at, you know, where a lot of people still house their funds is in 401ks as well. And, and Vanguard and Fidelity both being very big, um, custodians of that are administrators. And so that I think could be where maybe you have somebody in a retirement target date fund yeah. and maybe they assume. So some of this may be by default, I guess is what I'm getting at is that they may think that they're really conservative because they're in a 2020 fund or a 2024 That's possible. fund. And that could skew this a tad bit. But it does seem like the older generations are comfortable with stocks to get better returns. And well, listen, I think we've been trained. I think all investors have been trained to understand the, mar the, the Fed will bail you out. Yeah. The fiscal, the fiscal, the, uh, the, 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 the federal government's going to bail out banks. The Fed's going to bail you out in the st if, if stocks derail. We've been taught this time and time again. So it's not even younger generations, but older generations like, yeah, you know. So what point do, I, do you begin I, to look at bonds again and say, okay, this isn't as, the, the risk is not nearly as high as it was as of like last year, right? Mm -hmm. So at what point does somebody say, listen, I can go get this yield. I mean, two-year treasuries just hit a, hit a top in like, what, 16, 17 years? Um, but even going further out on the yield curve, you can get better yields without, with very little volatility than what we've historically been able to see in, in, in decades. Absolutely. I mean, it, there is... A balanced portfolio will have lower standard deviations and in some cases higher returns than an all equity portfolio. But what's nice to see is that ba also you got to remember there's a longevity factor here. Baby boomers also know that they might be living a lot longer and they want stocks for growth. But I think we've all been wired now or rewired to understand that, yeah, markets come down. They go up more than they go down. Uh, 
and the Fed's going to bail us out anyway. But yeah, we can get bonds at 6%, right? Um, why not balance out the portfolio? But the, the, the thought of this process is, and I understand where some people might be ticked off, which is what I got from this article, sort of the underlying current of it, is when you go sit with an advisor and they place you in a more conservative portfolio going, hey, listen, Mr. Smith, you're going to be in retirement. And Danny and I agree with this too. What they don't ever do is once they say, listen, go drop down to 20% stock, 80% fixed income because you can't afford big losses. They never go back and readjust the portfolio. You don't have to stay in that 2080 more conservative mix. It's an equity glide path that you need to follow. There's not, and there have been academic studies out there by um, Michael Kitches and Wade Fowle that show this, that if you want to have an appropriate way of looking at equities, you don't have to be stuck in a more conservative allocation. But once financial planners decrease equity exposure, they, they, never, they never change it. Well, that's the problem it's, with, it's, with it's, most so, investing is set it and forget it. You never make a change. You say, okay, here's where you are based on your risk tolerance, and you're stuck. We're going to rebalance every quarter. We're going to use modern portfolio theory to just blanket invest in everything, regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem lies, Rich. It is. And here's the heart of this, the study. It's called Plan U, and I call it unorthodox. But this is what I follow, too. You have stocks or a greater share of your portfolio through accumulation, right? You're increasing your human capital, your earning power stage. You decrease it at the beginning of retirement because I don't want to be derailed, Danny, right? We talk about this all the time. You can't, if I'm just about to transition from accumulation to distribution where I'm using my portfolio for retirement income, I don't want anything to interrupt me. So if there's even a, you know, a 15% drop in stocks, 10%, that might cause me to delay or interrupt my plan. So I want to make sure that I can land or switch gears without any issues. That doesn't mean that my portfolio gets buried and lies to die in a conservative allocation. There will be times when you can then increase your equity glide path. And I've been doing this since 2001. You just look at valuations or what's the better deal because you are probably going to live a very long time in yeah. retirement. Well, I, I think it's some of this is just needs to be that you need to understand where you are. Do you have your emergency funds? What's your buffer? What do you need to live on? Mm -hmm. Backing into these numbers, and then that'll allow you to, especially if the market conditions are right, to take advantage of that. And so it doesn't have to just be like one set. No, it doesn't. Rule. No. And we get back, we're going to talk about a behavioral cheat sheet. So you follow the advice laid out by the researchers and sort of what we do here, Danny and I, at RIA. We'll be right back. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com declare your financial independence and prepare for the second half of 2023 with the ria mid-year economic review saturday july 22nd with richard rosso danny ratliff and special guest chief investment strategist lance roberts get our report card for the market so far and what you need to know to invest profitably for the rest of the year register now for the ria IA Mid-Year Economic Review, Saturday, July 22nd, with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts, realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. 
Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors Advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. I get little hate messages from my daughter. She Venmos me her car note every month. When you Venmo somebody, you can put a note at the bottom of the transaction. It's like a memo, like on a check, Mm -hmm. right? So you say, this is what it's for. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. So she sends me nasty messages. Like through Venmo? Right, right. It's like, here's my car note. I was going to buy a new outfit, but I guess that's over. At realinvestmentadvice.com. Here's my car payment. Now I can't eat anything. (laughs) And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice. It's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell Report, plus each day's radio show, subscribe and book Mark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. I, well, I also heard that Kathy Bates is going to be the new Indiana Jones. So we'll see how that works out. And Brent looks different if you're on YouTube because he's got his RAA shirt on now. <laughs> well, I thought I'd join the club. He really did a, uh, like like Taylor Swift does, I think. He went into the back and changed his outfit right mm-hmm. before the next number. The green room. Yeah, <laughs> the green room. It's literally green. <laughs> yeah. Mold. Um, <laughs> so if you want a process of how to do this and think about how to transition or shift from accumulation to distribution first is you want to decrease your stock exposure the first year in retirement and don't worry about the missed opportunities you want to focus on your overall emotional state um can change we've seen this we call it the black hole it's that period immediately after retirement where you'll feel a bit displaced and not in control over your future Right. So then this this time of uneasiness will fade as, you know, your cash flow mechanisms are in place and you have your new lifestyle starts to emerge and you're going to do other things. You want to spend you want to monitor your household cash flow. Maybe you really want to dig real deep or micro budget. You want to look at your fixed expenses. In other words, you're going to focus on the issues that create uncertainty And you don't want to have greater stock exposure add to the stress. You're going to pay attention to the basics. And I think that's fine because you're transitioning and your focus might be diverted. And if you've got stocks, if you've got an 80% stock portfolio and you're doing it on your own, 
and you're not monitoring things, you might be unpleasantly surprised. So, Danny, we talk about this black hole, this, this transition, emotional mindset of not feeling like you've got your bearings quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's difficult because people are you're moving from one one type of iteration of you to the next and you have this blank canvas that you need to work with. And I think that's mm-hmm. where you know you're beginning to find you have new hobbies or things you enjoy. Or the opposite of that, Rich, sometimes you see people that go from work to new work, and that's essentially managing a portfolio. And you know, we get a lot of knocks on the door, phone calls from people who say, mm-hmm. Hey, I gotta give this up. I can't continue to do this just because, you know, their spouse is saying, hey, this is too much. I thought we were going to enjoy retirement, not wake up at three or four in the morning and monitor markets all day. Um, you know, it sounds sounds and feels like another job to me. But, you know, I, I think everybody needs to kind of be mindful of, of what works well for them. Where's your sense of purpose? What are things you're going to do once you do retire to avoid that black hole, Rich? And that's something that I feel like in this industry, we're so focused on the quantitative. We never talk about the qualitative and then how those two are tied together. Yes. I mean, they're very, very intertwined. But, you know, I, I think that if there's ways that you can give yourself maybe, if you've been managing funds, and like you said, Rich, you have 80% in the market, well, what's your, how much time are you going to spend on this each day? Right. Or is it a set it and forget it? You say, hey, you know what? I know the portfolio is going to work regardless of the market conditions and the plan works more importantly overall. Maybe that's well, the case, but I it think could that, be. But things are yeah. changing so quickly. Yep. I just don't think that works like it used to. I don't either. Now, here's where it could work, Danny. I was thinking, if I have sufficient guaranteed income, yep. I have pension or annuities and or Social Security. In other words, the money coming in from guaranteed income is enough to cover my expenses and more based on my lifestyle. Well... You know, then I'm really, my portfolio is looked at differently. Uh, I'm looking at it not for a source of income or, or a systematic withdrawal. I'm looking at it as something for my children and my grandchildren. And I'm just going to tack on an extended time frame to it. So I get that. But to Danny's point, you're, you're so concerned with all these other things and getting your bearings. So we always recommend you being more conservative up front in preparation but then as you build confidence you can increase equities when valuations are favorable right you you've got everything down the way you want it you got two years where the systematic withdrawals are coming in you're in a groove you know your budget you're not really looking at it as much you're really settling in and you're willing to take more risk i don't think there's anything wrong with that Right, You don't have to stay in that more conservative allocation unless the conditions warrant. But be open to making the change and don't stick to the traditional dogma that once you're in this conservative grave that you can't come out like a more aggressive zombie and change things up. Your portfolio is made to be fluid. It's not a rock or a tree, you can move it, you can change it as things change. Well, I don't, and I think that there's no one hard, fast rule for one for each person, right? Or for everyone, everybody's mm-hmm. gonna be a little bit different. So you need to understand what works for you, You know, understanding your own mindset. I, mean, I tell people all the time, so look, there's no amount of risk that you can take that's worth your sanity, your sleep. Exactly. And, and granted, I know anytime anything goes down, none of us like it, we don't like it, um, but we also have to understand that, you know, what's our discipline? How are we going to, to react to these types of scenarios and be proactive in front of it? You know, understanding technicals, fundamentals, what's going on in the marketplace. But you know, how do you do that if you're managing these funds individually? Right. I think is really important. Or how does your advisor do that? Right. And that means, as we talked about with guaranteed income, you got to gain an understanding of Social Security and how to maximize these numbers. I worked with a client yesterday. And she pulled her social security statement. She's 69 and we're waiting till 70, but she hasn't checked it in a while. And when she checked it, she was shocked. The increase? (laughs) Yeah. She is going to get per month from social security, right? So I'm, if you have that kind of social security that's coming in, you've maxed out the system. Okay. Well, then you can go ahead and add more exposure to stocks because if I'm getting more, as we said, guaranteed income, 
the volatility, which is usually not your friend in retirement, I can look at it a lot different. And you can expand your stocks. Also, you got to keep in mind, and we talked about this, is life expectancy. So um, nobody has a crystal ball to know the, how, how long they're going to live. But, uh, you know, I have one client that over 10 years ago says, listen, I'm going to be gone in five years. And he's still here. I said, I'm sorry, you're still here. You said you were going to be dead. We had 30% in equities 10 years ago. Now his allocation is 45 to 50%. So good health, longer life expectancies. You have additional time to weather out the stock volatility. So to your point, Danny, you can't just set it in a little box of an allocation because you're a certain age. And this article proves it. Um, and again, I just think that <laughs> we're just so complacent now about stocks and we know the Fed's going to come in on the white horse, let's face it, and until they don't. Oh, they're going to do their best to, and at some point it just may not matter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You also have to remain sensitive to your portfolio withdrawal rate. So if you go through a poor sequence of returns, and Lance writes about this a lot, um, you can have a depletion of wealth that can really take your confidence in your financial plan down dramatically, right? So you got to look at it. We look at it over three-year periods. Um, and then also look to rebalance at that point. So look at surplus versus deficit. So in other words, if you go through a few years of a, and you are dependent more on your variable assets, your stocks and bonds to live, you can't just say, Danny, 4% withdrawal rate, keep my eyes closed. It's just like driving on I-10 with no brakes and, and, your, and your eyes shut. You, you can't do it. There's no such thing as a fixed portfolio withdrawal rate from a variable asset. It, you got to monitor it and possibly adjust. Thoughts? No, I agree. I mean, I, th I think that it just can't be that set it and forget it. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. There's really the, not a whole lot to add there. So think about this. You can do a few things you can do, right? You can say, hmm, so my portfolio is down and I still need my money. Maybe I don't increase my withdrawals next year. Or maybe... I look at reducing them. You got to come up with, in a financial plan, we look at guardrails. We look at, this is the income you asked for. You asked for X amount. That's the middle lane. That's what you want. Great. Now, are, can I, what's the outer reaches of that? What's the left lane of that income that you can expand to? So in good times, you want to take more money and do something special, give yourself a raise, you could do it. But yes, what if we have to go right lane? and contract, what does that look like? But unless my middle lane is really healthy, would you find out, you know what, Danny, when we look at plans from other firms, brokerage firms, they don't ever station that middle lane properly. They don't look at, okay, you have to sustain in this middle lane. It's just that as soon as there's a deviation out of that lane, the whole plan falls apart, where it's not a guardrail you know, expansion, contraction, right lane, left lane, middle lane. That middle lane is the lane. And it's going to be perfect sailing on, in that lane forever, no matter what the road conditions are. And we found out during the pandemic and even through last year that that was not the case for many people. It only took one year of poor returns to screw up their lifetime of retirement. And that's ridiculous. Anything else? I got a lot, but we don't have a whole lot of time. We so. don't. You know, well, I think the sequence of return risk is so important mm -hmm. to understand and understand what that math of loss looks like if you see a significant decline. So that's why it needs to be something that is fluid. You can manage the risk, understand how it impacts the portfolio. Like you said, unfortunately, there's not a lot of middle lane, at least in what we find in a lot of places. So be cautious, understand your plan, the implications. If you get that down here, because you don't want that to derail you. But nope. We'll be right back after this break.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Declare your financial independence and prepare for the second half of 2023 with the RIA Mid-Year Economic Review. Saturday, July 22nd with Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Chief Investment Strategist Lance Roberts. Get our report card for the market so far and what you need to know to invest profitably for the rest of the year. Register now for the RIA Mid-Year Economic Review. Saturday, July 22nd with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. And now another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. <laughs> And we're back. Um, interesting study. This financial planner spent five years studying 233 millionaires to learn about their habits and the way they think. And we talk about what we call the super savers and one of our favorite favorite books, Millionaire Next Door. So the um, millionaires that he interviewed all different backgrounds, uh, $160,000 in annual gross income, 3.2 million in net assets. So he, he wanted to see of like, what did they spend their money on and where did they stop wasting money? What were things that they didn't do? And here's some interesting stuff, Danny. One was they avoided buying processed and packaged foods. So they stopped buying low quality processed food and instead opted for organic, or wholesome foods that did not have preservatives, farmers markets, uh, grocery stores that were known for high quality products. In other words, health equal wealth for this group was an investment. Like when I grew up, I was most like, if you will rip me open right now, I'm probably mostly Twinkies and Ding Dongs, okay? We didn't have money. So the processed foods, you know, even my girlfriend goes, everything you have to eat in a plastic package? Like, no, I don't do that anymore, but that's how I grew up it's because it was cheaper. But the, it, it's, you know, we talk about this health versus wealth connection. So I thought that was pretty fascinating, Danny, how they want to be healthier and will go ahead and not waste their money on processed foods. And now people will argue with me, well, don't you understand that that's pretty much what we can afford? And I just said that myself. But I even think if you don't have the means of someone that's making $160,000, you can still make better choices. And, and I think um, there's, a lot of, there's, there's a lot to this, right? Because there is a lot of waste when you go to the store and you, you buy too much. I mean, we see that within our own household, but we do primarily eat um, you know, non-processed foods. We're, you're having to cook. Kids come over to the house and they're not real happy with the selection of snacks that we have at the Ratliff household. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's oh, honestly, gosh. right? And the kids are like, hey, do you want to try one of these? And I'm like, no, stop doing that. James is sucking on a lemon. Like, hey, you want some? That. No, no, it's not that bad. But <laughs> no, but you're making smart, you know. Well, and, uh, and, it's and, good. and there's ways it's good. I know that we could even do better with this because, you know, we're on the run. We've got three kids. We're constantly, you know, we're trying to cook, plan ahead. 
But we've noticed that if we will actually be more deliberate about it and you know, one meal plan or you only go when you buy you know, each day or every other day. And that way you don't have much waste. You're using everything that you have on hand. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give you a whole lot of options. So you say, hey, today I want meatballs, but you know what? We're going to go ahead and do this instead. And then something else that you needed for that is gets old. So there's ways that you can do this very, like I said, it's, it's got to be deliberate. It does. But it saves money. In the long run, we find. And yeah. we don't eat out much, but when we do, you know, we share meals. People think we're, we're broke. I mean, but... Brent's going to chime in about well, the I, Mexican food he's eating. Oh, no, I was going to mention Keith Klein always likes to say, make uh, better bad choices. That, yeah. that's... You know, which yeah. it's, it's a mindset. It is. It is. Um, and I always look at it as if I eat poorly, it's going to cost me more in the long run. Um, and I'm like, the quality of your retirement's not going to be there. So I thought that that was good. They also refuse to drop money on cheaply made goods. They don't buy the latest fashion trends or inexpensive or poorly constructed furniture, right? So they looked at more timeless pieces, less of these investments, right? So, so yes, the cost was higher, but they were comfortable making those purchases, but they also know they don't have to purchase them again. Like if you buy furniture that's poorly constructed, you're probably going to have to replace that furniture every few years. And they would rather upfront say, well, spend a little bit more. And I always think there's a mid road for that. Don't you? Like, I don't want the highest, I don't need the highest, most expensive and I don't want the cheapest. But if I go search somewhere in the middle, um, I'm, I'm okay with that. But there are pieces that they own from this, from this uh, survey that they say, listen, we, we don't have to replace it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we shop the scratch and dent. Like, hey, this has a scratch on it. Because oh, I know my kids are going to beat something up. I mean, that's just And go ahead and I dare here. you, when you go find a washer, dryer, scratch, which I will always do too, go ahead and find the scratch or the dent. I dare you. It, you got to really look hard. Because when I want to buy a washer dryer, I look at a basic, what do I need it to do? I need it to wash my clothes. I don't need it to sing me a song. I don't need it to read me a book. I don't need to ding at me. I need it to wash the clothes. I don't need it in teal and I don't need it in RIA blue. I want a washer dryer. I figured you'd have been avocado green. No. Well, I loved that as a kid. But that was a basic color. My grandparents had green appliance. A little nostalgic there. Yeah, Brady Bunch. They all had green. Harvest Gold. Harvest Gold. But those weren't premium colors. You didn't pay more for those. Now it's like, oh, yeah. you want fuchsia? You want a fuchsia washer dryer? It's ridiculous. Last time we bought a washing machine, we, we asked the salesman, which is the one that lasts the longest? And he said, get you a hot point. Because that's what and, the and steamships put on board. Oh. Because they, you know, if it breaks out in the middle of the ocean, you can't repair it. I also know the Speed Queen. And when I was a kid, mm-hmm. when I was like 11 years old, I used to help my mother in a flop house called the Terminal Hotel in Coney <laughs> Island to wash the sheets. And I'm still queasy right now. And all the washeterias, all the laundromats had Speed Queens. Yes. And now I notice Speed Queen makes a washer. So in other words, they're looking at dependability. In that vein, they're, t- they're saying that they prefer to spend money uh, on completely replacing things like old roofs, washing machines, dishwashers, refrigerators, rather than putting the money toward expensive repairs. You know, here's the thing that always, that is a conundrum for me, Danny. Maybe you can shed some light. These American Home Shield and all these warranties, and then I read stories about the, the, the people that come out and service these things. So people will pay to, for a month to insure their appliances. And then all I see are, well, they send out this group of people that have no idea what they're doing. In other words, to me, is that even worth it to warranty do something like an American Home Shield. I think it's nice when you're getting a new home, right? And a lot of times they're giving that to you as oh, you purchase front, the house. On new appliances, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've never had a good experience with something like that. I have that. just not had good experiences with you, Brent. No. I just, just don't see it worth the money. No. Well, it's Look. like you said. I mean, they, they come out because the ice maker is broken, and then they come back out. They have the wrong part. And 
you know what? Oh, we're going to be here between twelve and six, and you know. And they'll and they notice they'll patch it up like they yeah. don't like mm-hmm. it might need to be replaced, but they're going to do everything before that, which is going to cause you more frustration as well, opposed to maybe taking that money and putting it in a money market every yeah. month and just building it up in an emergency fund. Well, time is money, right? And there, there, I'm sure there's many instances where it's been very well worth it, but especially if something large breaks down. Yeah, I have a hard time with it. Yeah, I just don't see the value in it. Um, but and they don't either. And you so, like insuring everything. I do, and this is where I don't get it. Um, okay. So here's another thing: outdoor tools and equipment. They say they do enjoy outdoor work, but for the most part, they're hiring landscapers to take care of all their outdoor upkeep. They didn't want to. They, in other words, they're buying their time. They look at what their time is worth. Now, I know people who work and cut their lawns, and they do have a lot of money, but they, it's therapy for them. You yeah. know, it's more of a, something that they like to do, and I get that. But the, the mentality is here is if I could spend my time doing something more productive and hire a landscaper, I will do that. And this is a contentious debate uh-oh. in our household, uh-oh. very much so. She wants to mow the yard to do everything, and I, I just I, I don't dislike doing it, I, but I don't have the time for it. Well, and that's it. Yeah. If, like if, you said, what's your time worth? Yeah, yeah, I do the yard. It takes at least a half day, maybe three quarters, <laughs> because the way I do it, I haven't got that time, that kind of time anymore. Yeah. I, I'm and either so, we're, I'm either here or I'm with the kids. Yeah. Bottom line. So a crew comes in once a week and does it in thirty minutes. Right. Done. And they're gone. And they're they gone. They get it done yeah. and they're yeah. gone. And I personally, sometimes I will mow the lawn just because I want to get, I want to think about some stuff. And yeah. I will go ahead yeah. and do it. But for the most part, they're saying, what's my time worth? And I would rather hire somebody to do certain things versus what my, my time and doing other things that are more productive. So. Last one is lottery tickets. So they don't like lottery tickets. Right? They don't want to spend money on lottery tickets and encourage their friends to do the same. Because, of course, any winnering of a lottery is slim. I disagree with this. I know why you like it. You like it for the dreams and the thoughts and the I creativity like the scra- aspect of yeah, it. Yeah, and I don't buy them often. I don't. But I like the idea of a scratch. I think there's something about buying that scratch off ticket. And like you said, the endorphins of r- scratching through that and figuring out if I win, what will I do? He's thinking about buying an island to create a tiny home nation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we already I know mean, where for the five bucks that I spent, I got more entertainment. Well, you're easily amused. I, I, I am. I'm very easily amused. But for it most also keeps people, keeps Amy busy on road trips. Well, there's She's that. scratching with the quarters. And it's, the it's a stupid tax on the mathematically challenged. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as far as what they're saying in the spirit of the study, yeah, lottery tickets are an absolute waste of money. But I'm like, <laughs> sometimes you just want to scratch something. You take your machete and you start scratching that ticket. Thinking it's your ex's head? I'm kidding. Of course I'm joking. That's a joke. Lighten up, everybody. The weekend's here. Well, we so appreciate you being with us today. Lance back on Monday. Hope you all have a good weekend. Go take a look at Lance's newsletter. Sign up. RIA Advisors, realinvestmentadvice.com. Take care.